Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Before we start, uh, I want to wish you and your families all well. And I have to take note of how great a job Greece has done in these very difficult times handling this crisis and how well it is faring as a result uh, due to the incredible efforts by the government and by the people. Hellenic Innovation Network, with the support of the Greek Consulate of Boston and MIT Enterprise Forum Greece, is driven uh, by a dedicated group of people who meet monthly at the Greek Consulate in Boston in order to organize events, which take place uh, twice per year, which offer a link from Greece to the United States by offering opportunities, a chance to pitch and network within the very rich Boston ecosystem. Under the leadership of George Dimosthenus, we also have a CEO group which meets monthly. While our events are typically held in Boston due to the COVID-19 crisis, we are going to be hosting a series of Zoom chats, 30-minute uh, chats, um, and uh, this will allow us to keep our community together during this time until our next event, which will be hosted at the MIT Media Lab on November 12th, and we hope to see you then at that time. If you'd like to be informed of news and events, please sign up at hellenic.org. And during the event today, if you have any questions, please feel free to share them with your name, either via Zoom on the Q&A or under the YouTube channel. So without uh, further ado, I will um, pass this along. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Marina, for your leadership in one more great uh, initiative. The Consulate General of Greece in Boston is happy to support and be an integral part of this great networking effort. Boston plays a central role globally in research and innovation, and especially right now during uh, the biotech battle against COVID-19, a crisis which uh, Greece has been tackling so successfully, uh, letting uh, science shape public policy. We have uh, supported from the very beginning the Hellenic Innovation Network, our efforts are complementary as a science diplomacy and the connection between the research and innovation ecosystems of Boston and Greece uh, are our top priorities. I'm very grateful to Aristos Doxiadis and Professor Dermidzakis for supporting uh, these efforts. Um, and finally, I would like to thank uh, and invite to our panel Vasily Papakostadinou from MIT Enterprise Forum Greece. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you, Strato. Thank you, Marina. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our webcast tonight. Uh, my name is Vasilis Papakostadino, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Hellenic Innovation Network and the vice chairman of MIT Enterprise Forum Greece, a nonprofit organization with a mission to help technology entrepreneurs turn their startups into global companies. Our flagship program is the startup competition. We are currently in the final stage of the competition's sixth edition with great teams, some of which are coming straight out from Greek research labs. You can follow us on social media and keep an eye for the announcement of the finals event in early July. We're particularly interested in ventures coming out of the Greek universities, and as such, it is a great pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Manolis Dermitakis. And to kick off the discussion, I would like to ask him what is the revision regarding technology transfer from labs to the global market and what are the plans to accelerate the process? Aristo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm very honored to be the host of this first webcast and honored to introduce Manolis Ermitzakis, uh, whom I have uh, met and got to know recently in the past six months since we are both members of the newly created National Council for Research, Technology and Innovation in Greece. Manolis is chair and I am vice chair. Uh, Manolis is professor of genetics uh, in the Department of Genetic Medicine and Development at the University of Geneva Medical School in Switzerland. I am not going to go through all his awards and honors, but I will say that he has been named highly cited researcher by ISI every year from 2014 onwards. His research focuses on genetic causes of human disease. And as I said, uh, recently in December, he became chairman of the National Council and he has, he has been devoting half his time, he's taken a half sabbatical from the university and he's devoting at least half his time for the next few months or perhaps years. It's a three year tenure 
to, to help him drive, uh, shape and drive policy on research technology and innovation in Greece. Uh, now, Manoli, we don't, it's going to be a concise discussion and I, I'm sure our here, uh, listeners would like to hear a lot more, but let's try to cover some ground here. The conventional wisdom about the research community in Greece is that it produces excellent research uh, as indicated by the number of publications in peer-reviewed journals and by the number of citations, etc. But very, very little of that research translates into commercial products, as evidenced by the very low number of, of pet patents that come out of the research community, almost no spin-offs, almost no commercialization of results. Now, do you accept this conventional wisdom that it's very, very good on research, but the problem is in the transfer? Okay, well, first thing, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to, to be in this, uh, in this forum, um, and hopefully that will uh, trigger some discussion and thought. Um, I don't actually accept exactly that, that interpretation of reality, uh, and I don't accept it because I think that while we have in Greece a lot of good researchers, a lot of excellent researchers, some of them are world leading in, in their respective field, I think that given the, the, the volume of, that, of the community, the number of researchers, the number of research institutes, the number of universities and, and professors working in that, we're actually underrepresented in the leadership of science internationally. So if I were to rate uh, Greek science, Greek research in general, without pointing to individuals, it would be more of like a B, B plus. Um, so, and, and I think that comes from, in, in many different ways, I think that people are great. There's a lot of people that are very talented that, you know, they studied in the best places in the world, or sometimes they've stayed in the Greek system and they have produced uh, amazing early discoveries. But when they go into sort of the, the system of, of becoming a researcher in Greece, becoming a group leader, setting up your research group, they generally don't find it very easy to advance. You know, there's lack of, there's lack of funding, there's lack of uh, regular funding, lack of specific uh, uh, mechanisms that will keep a, a laboratory uh, uh, in, a, in a sort of a steady stream of production. Uh, there's lack of infrastructure that will allow some of these uh, uh, discoveries to be made. There's a lot of difficulties in, in dealing with bureaucracy. There's a huge number of problems which probably there's no need to describe. But that means that we're actually not- Could I, could I, could I interrupt you for a second? You yes. say there's lack of regular funding. Could yes. you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, so regular funding in the vast majority of places in the world, uh, there's usually what we call a, an equivalent of a National Science Foundation that ensures that there's a deadline once, twice, three times a year. And, and that deadline is, you know, you submit your proposal and you get reviews. And there's a success rate that can range from anywhere from 10% to even like 50% that you have in Switzerland. And people through that mechanism can get regular funding. So that means that if you're a competitive lab, you can actually compete for, for funding. And if you are in good shape, you will get that funding, maybe not the first time, but the second time or the third time. That means you can plan, you can arrange, uh, you know, you can see how your experiments are, are being done. You can plan how you fund your students, your postdocs, and generally you can keep an active lab by having some specific process that as long as you're competitive and you have strong research as a background, you can always claim the funding in the future. That doesn't exist in Greece. We don't have a National Science Foundation. Uh, you know, funding is sporadic. Much of the lab, actually, there's no, there's no core funding that is more research. There's one institution that was created recently called ELIDEC that has very limited funds. And much of the, the research depends either on European funding or on what we call ESPA in Greece, which is essentially the European structural funds, which are very much into the innovation and entrepreneurship and less on, on, on producing knowledge. So that is actually a big issue. So um, I don't think we're producing the best science that we can given the people that we have. Mm -hmm. So that is the first problem that I see. So naturally, if you don't produce your best results, if you don't have your best discoveries, you, you suffer from two things. First of all, there's not enough to translate or whatever you translate is weak relative to an environment like Boston or San Francisco London, uh, other, several places in Germany and so on. So you're not competitive. And naturally the outcome of those entrepreneurial activities are not world leading. So it's much more difficult to have an idea 
that is at that level that you can get funding that is very large and you can create a very uh, successful uh, uh, private uh, sector activities. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a systemic problem that starts from very early on. So, and as you said, and it's, it, that's very clear, we actually have a very big gap between translating even the few good discoveries into something that is entrepreneurial and, and competitive internationally. There's lack of mechanism, but also I think there's a lack of mentality too. Have you identified any, any areas um, where you think we are stronger than average? Uh, would, you, would you venture to, to pick a few areas where you think we are better than average? The two areas that I've, without going into too much detail, I think life sciences and, and engineering are probably the two areas that I would consider are our best, uh, our best uh, performing areas uh, in terms of past successes. I think the last few years, we've also seen a lot of success in computer science in general, artificial intelligence, this kind of things, partly because they're relatively easy to put together. So you don't need elaborate labs and very complicated, expensive machines, you just need good people that can code, they're very smart, and then some computer uh, cluster, which is generally relatively easy to set up, or you can even just contract out computer clusters from, from around the world. So this has been something that was a sort of a good um, solution for very smart people to go into this artificial intelligence space. And that's why we've seen more and more of these labs actually popping up in different research institutes and universities, accumulating lots of successful uh, activities, in particular, uh, attracting funding. The other issue that we see increase is that the relationship between funding and, and, and let's say, publication is not, is not very strong. So we are actually, in, in terms of indicators, we're very good in, in attracting funding. Actually, Greece is one of the top countries per capita in terms of attracting funding. But actually, that's, a, that's a, a sort of the, the irony of it. That funding doesn't translate in the best performance research-wise, and it doesn't, I mean, even we have officially, let's say, good publication record, uh, that is more of a sort of a, a number of papers type of a problem rather than hitting the tops of the, the sort of the, the top of, uh, of each individual field having a big impact. We're not, so just to summarize in a little bit, I think in Greece, we are certainly not driving science internationally. Okay. I think what we're doing is, we used to be very far from the driver in the back seat, very far back. We are closer to the front seat. We are closer to becoming drivers, but just universally, we're just not driving. And I think Greece needs to pick up, to pick those areas that we can drive. Life science is one of them. I think some, kind, some aspects of engineering is another. And I think computer science could be a third one that is emerging now. Okay, thanks for that. Now, um, we've started with this, a uh, new team uh, in SETEC, the National Council, in December. We have a three-year tenure ahead of us until December 2022. What, when, you, when we finish this three-year tenure, what would you like to have achieved? What are the, the priorities and, and the potential achievements out there? Yeah, so to, to me, you know, in order to, to achieve something, we've discussed this many times, we need to have something tangible. You know, we can just talk, sort of talk philosophically about, I would like Greece to be like that or Greece like this, but that can only be achieved by tangible things that, have, that are stable over time, that are sustainable, that any government, even change of government will actually accept them and will, will keep supporting them. So thinking of tangible things, I think what we need is a National Science Foundation. I mean, it's, it's actually one of the few countries, maybe the only one, in the European Union that doesn't have any mechanism like that. And the one we do actually, that is actually too small to be doing its job. That needs to be combined with central funding from the government budget rather than from the European budget, uh, because it needs to be something that is provisioned. And, and in some ways we need to build that relationship with the government, the understanding that this is the sort of the source of all the knowledge and, and, and innovation that is gonna to come to Greece. The second thing that, so, a National Science Foundation, that's an organization we need to build. Uh, let, let, uh, before you move to the second yeah. thing, just stick on this a bit. Um, uh, uh, because I've heard you argue about this. The problem is that there's, it, there's too much fragmentation, right? Uh, we have uh, some institutes that are not, that are um, sort of overseen by 
different ministries like the agriculture ministry and so on. Most of them are under the Ministry of Development, the so-called General Secretary for Secretariat for Technology. Um, and then you have the university the research labs, and there doesn't seem to be any coherent strategy for where to prioritize in each of those. Is, is that the main reason why you want a national science foundation? Well, I mean, funding is the first, right? Regular funding. You need to have a mechanism that can ensure that you have the appropriate budget and the appropriate evaluation process. Mm -hmm. But also it's, the, it's leadership in science. Like, for example, uh, you know, we just put together a, a project for COVID-19 in Greece, which we may talk about a little bit later if we have time. And to put that together, it was extremely painful for one simple reason. There was no single framework that you can develop such a project other than just to get a bunch of people together and do it. Yeah. In any other country, you would have the National Science Foundation that would issue a call, people will apply, there's a fast track mechanism for evaluation, and then they will coordinate that because they have the administrative and the scientific uh, uh, organization to be doing that. I had to do it with a few other people just by kind of putting pieces together. And it needed to be done. I, don't, I didn't like that it had to be done in this way because that kind of violates the principles of evaluation that we should have. But the alternative would be that nothing happens. Mm -hmm. So we need strategic leadership. We need coordination. Research institutes should not be just kind of floating around as they do, doing something that a department of biology or a department of physics should be doing. They should be doing something more strategic. And they don't do that because nobody coordinates that. that, that nobody has, there's no single entity that gives, provides that vision uh, that will allow those research institutes to actually have a much bigger impact, not only in research, but also in society through entrepreneurial activities. Okay, so what's next after that? So after that, I mean, uh, the, the next thing that is obvious is that if we start making discoveries, we need to be able to translate them. There's lack of mentality in researchers. They don't even know how to do this. And even if they have something, they probably go to sometimes international lawyers to deal with patents and all these things. So we need strong patent offices, uh, technology transfer offices, and an environment that will allow many of these discoveries to be monitored by people that are not necessarily the researchers themselves. They're people that understand the market, let's say, and can pick opportunities. You know, there's a lot of things. One of the things that I find interesting is that uh, many governments in Europe, and I've seen the, this government in Greece doing that, they identify translational science as actually the source of knowledge that will create entrepreneurial activities. But if you go to Boston and San Francisco in particular, you will see that actually many of the startups are based on some methodology developed under basic science projects that studying, you know, bugs or uh, looking at something completely irrelevant to translational science. But the methodologies developed to perform the project turn out to be useful for a whole bunch of other things. We are not even close to that. So we need to actually have a mechanism that understands the opportunities, sees the technology, and, and actually encourages people when it's necessary to translate, to bring it to the next level. And then we need to have the appropriate mechanism to bring the funding, to bring the international VCs, to bring all this attention, as I know the MIT Enterprise Forum is doing, in order, to, but that's not enough, in order to actually speed up this process. And that would be, and the problem with Greece is that we are not the financially strong a country to take IP from external, like from let's say Germany to buy intellectual property from other countries and bring it to Greece to develop startups. We can only do this from knowledge that is developed within Greece. So we better produce that knowledge, have the mechanism to translate it into something that is visible to the appropriate people and then create that additional activity. And finally, you need the appropriate financial environment to get these startups to, to evolve. You know, we're not in a position, you know, you we realize now in mean, this crisis, probably one, one clear idea of that. There was no mechanism that we could identify startups. So if you wanted to support them, it's the, the mechanism to identify them is not there. So all this, essentially, we need to develop specific tangible uh, items in what is an ecosystem that will link even what we call basic research, which I call it more curiosity driven research all the way to the different steps of producing knowledge, translating a, fra a small fraction of it, 
making entrepreneurial activities and they're having an impact on the economy. By the way, I should, I think I should uh, tell uh, our viewers here that this is the first time where this National Council for Research is called National Council for Research, Technology and Innovation and is composed not just from, of people from the research community, but also from business. So there's, uh, it's an 11 person council. We have six people, including yourself from the research community and five people, including myself from the business community. And I think we are working well together in, in understanding each other's concerns and how this will work out. And we plan to set up what are called Tomeaka uh, Epistemon Kasimbulia, vertical, let's say, uh, little councils that will deal with specific scientific areas like the life sciences or with specific horizontal things like data policy, for example, or upskilling policy for, for innovation and so on. Yeah, and absolutely, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And, and actually, I was a little bit, when, when, the, when the, the idea of that mixed, let's say, council uh, was, was, was put together, um, I was actually unsure how this is gonna work mm -hmm. because I didn't know how well the chemistry was gonna be between people. But I realized now that that was a great idea. It wasn't my idea, by the way, um, but it was a great idea because as you can see, of course, the right people have to be in the right place. The chemistry is great. We actually have a seamless interaction. And, and even though the, the idea was that there's two sub councils that will sort of meet independently, we ended up not ever using that mechanism because we were very happy to work together on any, other, any side of the question because we all develop an understanding of, of the complete ecosystem that we need to develop. Okay. Um, now, since we're in the COVID-19 phase of this huge once in a lifetime, perhaps, crisis, uh, I'd like to get, get back to what we talked about before, but explain a bit more. How is the research community, research labs, contributing to the response of the state to this crisis? It was an interesting process. So the, the first thing that was a surprise to me is that obviously this is a, this is a medical uh, uh, problem, right? This is a sort of a health related problem. And naturally doctors, MDs are the ones that need to respond first, they need to prepare hospitals and so on. But it became very clear, and you would see it from international efforts, that understanding the virus, understanding, doing research on even clinical information, as well as trying to establish certain infrastructure that would help and support whatever we're, we're learning from it was, was actually quite crucial. And unfortunately, exactly because of the lack of leadership, there was no way that research institutes would coordinate. So I would speak to my friends in research institutes, and they would just go home and occasionally have a lab meeting and do nothing. And I felt that was a big waste. So we talked to a few people and started saying, let's put some testing together. You know, you, you see it in the Broad Institute, University of Washington, people are transforming their facilities from what they usually do for research into testing facilities. So we started discussing that and people were extremely responsive and progressively discussions advanced so that we combined a testing proposal to, to improve, to essentially create a testing, a testing framework that not only would allow for more tests per day, but at the same time will allow for tests that will be using what we call a more primitive protocol that is more independent of the international markets of uh, sort of, let's say, kits that would be available from companies like Roche and so on, so that Greece could be potentially independent if there was a major lack of, of reagents. And at the same time, develop a research component to it, uh, which involves genetic analysis of, of the of the host, essentially humans, the people that have contracted the virus, the sequencing of the virus itself and creating an epidemiological framework around it, trying to understand if there is gonna be genetic susceptibility mechanisms that would make somebody you know, become uh, more severely ill or even uh, pass away relative to somebody who passed it even without any symptoms. And, this, and, and the reason, the rationale for that was that it's been shown that when drug development and any other therapeutic intervention is informed by genetics, it actually has a four to 10 times higher chance of making it through the various steps and the various phases and becoming a successful and, uh, and effective drug. And so we thought that this could be a very quick thing, but there's a huge variability in the, in, the symptom, in the symptoms and the progression of the disease. And that to me screams that there's some fraction at least of a genetic effect especially if it's something that is unique, like a single mutation that changes the, the, 
the, the, the progression of the, of, of, of the disease. So to me, um, so it was a little bit of a difficult effort, but I was extremely excited to see that as soon as you, you seed it with, with a little bit of energy, then people get excited. Yeah. And then throw the energy of the research environment, which to me showed the huge potential. If you were to bring something more sustainable, much more stable, you would actually trigger a, much, a very strong effect uh, that would probably be sustainable for a very long time. So that made me a lot more optimistic about the future of Greek research, assuming we can build those initial steps to push it forward. Okay, thanks for that. There's uh, uh, several questions from the audience. We don't have time for all of them, but uh, Kostas Rosato from Temple University is asking, uh, what will the council do to access the untapped potential of Greek diaspora researchers, investors, and entrepreneurs? Well, that's a, that's a great pool of people and ideas and the energy that has been, uh, has, been, uh, has been sort of dormant because nobody's asking them to do anything for a long, a long time. I'm one of them, actually. <laughs> I live, I've lived, in, I lived away from Greece for more than 23 years now. Um, first of all, we're open to them. So we're open to ideas, we're open to listening to them. I would love to have something that was a little bit more tangible. We discussed at some point about creating a sort of a, what we call the test at the Mecca Simbulia that is, is, is sort of representing essentially ideas that come from the outside. But I think this is something that we need to develop a little bit more integrating the system. We need to put these people in the process rather than as a separate process. Yeah. So personally, there's nothing specific I can think right now, but other than encouraging more their participation and not them necessarily coming, but we asking them in evaluation processes in advisory boards, in all these things that are necessary. I think that at this stage, when we have a much more structured environment with the National Science Foundation and so on, I think there'll be better roles for them to play and hopefully creating such stable structures will make some of them come back, which is actually one of the major, obje major objectives of such an effort in boosting research. Yeah, I, by the way, since I deal with technology startups as, an, as a venture capitalist, I have seen this in that sector. People are coming back when good startups are there. Uh, you know. um, Sofia Kambanis is asking, are there incubators in Greece? And if so, what is the role in helping labs commercialize their innovation? I can take that if you want. For I think, Arista, you probably will give a better answer than me. <laughs> I think, uh, well, there are maybe a dozen incubators. Uh, some of them are better, some not so good. Uh, however, very few of those focus on, on the research community, on getting uh, results out of the labs. Some researchers, some research teams, I would say maybe, half a dozen, certainly not many more than 10, um, have tried to go into incubators and we have seen a few interesting startups coming out of there. But I think that the problem is not the lack of incubators, there's other problems in the research community like lack of incentives, for example, or lack of technology transfer mechanism with knowledgeable people like uh, Manolis was saying, people who understand patents, for example. These are the main problems rather than the incubators at this stage. Um, I think we are uh, almost out of time. There is one final question that I have here. One, uh, Stamatiki Kritas from the Helen Bio Cluster is asking, is there a strategic plan for the creation of a National Science Foundation? You, ought, you sort of answered that. And how can it help the ecosystem at this point? But let me uh, tweak that question a bit. Some people have been telling us the problem with a centralized organization like the National Science Foundation is that if you give a, get a government that is clientelistic and wants you know, to just appoint their own people and so on, then it screws up the whole system. Whereas if it's fragmented, it's much harder to have this type of, of influence. So what's your answer to that? I mean, that's, that's a very good strategy, divide and conquer. If that guy could be an alternative, right? Because in some ways, actually, the, it's the opposite. If you have a fragmented research community and a centralized government-owned budget, you can play favors in any way you want, right? And I've seen that, we've experienced. So that means that if you know the, the person who, carries, who has the funding, you can actually get funding with the other, one, the other person not. So I believe that a centralized process, even though it actually gives more power to the government, it's actually the one that ensures that a certain process is followed. Now, uh, 
we can create a structure that at least in the first few years, until we learn how to manage this properly, we actually have the appropriate checks and balances so that we have distance from the appointment of these people that drive the National Science Foundation from the, let's say the minister of whatever minister we're talking about. You know, in the US, the, the director of NIH is appointed by the president, but the, pre the director of NIH can actually make strong statements against the president if they want to, they can go to Congress and actually claim funding that even the president might be against. So we can actually build that mentality, but until we do, we need to actually build the appropriate distance between that organization and the government to ensure that the best people are there. I think we can do it. I think there's a lot of things that we've done before in completely unrelated areas that we now consider forgiven. Like for example, the process for hiring public employees is something that was completely, um, uh, you know, impossible before, but now it's a standard. I think we can build these processes, but we just need to initially secure and, and guarantee that the beginning of the system is actually protected. Um, okay, but um, still, there, there seems to be a concern about that. And one thing we did discuss in, in our council, which maybe is of interest to this uh, set of viewers, is that we feel that if, it, if we involve enough diaspora Greeks in the National Science Foundation or in other uh, governing bodies, this somehow detaches, it makes the, the political pressure less, uh, less, uh, let's say, less, uh, less of a pressure because people who are in the, in the diaspora don't depend very much on personal connections and perhaps they can be more detached and strategic. So this will be one of our, of our tactics for, uh, for doing that. Um, to, to just add one sentence to that, I think that's a great idea. We need to keep a balance because what I've learned from this six month process so far is that actually too much of diaspora can actually create such a distance that it's irrelevant. That, that's true. So we yeah. need to create that appropriate balance where we get the independence from abroad, but as, as well as the relevance from within Greece, as long as we have the right people. I have one other interesting question here from Maris Persidis. He says, in our more virtual world, is there a new model of collaborating, connecting Greek research with the outside that will bypass systemic support? In other words, as if I understand it, build the networks from below. I think the networks are easy to build, but when you don't have money, you cannot actually be a, a strong partner in the network. It's mm -hmm. exactly the problem of, uh, you know, I, I think that I, I mean, I, as myself, I can link a lot of geneticists from Greece with international consortia but then their participation will be crippled because they have nothing to contribute. They don't have the funding. So it's not just about the network. I think the network is easy. People have the ability to travel, to connect. Uh, there's a lot of people going to Greece. It's actually having the ability to, to be a, an equal partner in international partnerships. And for example, with this project funded now for COVID-19, we can see that. We actually bring three and a half thousand people that we can study that immediately makes Greece an equal, if not one of the top partners in yeah. what is the national partnership. With no funding, what are you gonna do? You may be going to analyze some data, but nobody's paying as much attention as for the other ones that are producing massive amounts of data. Okay, last question, and then we have to stop with over, we've gone over our time limit. Uh, from Stella Karabas, maybe I should take that, is can you discuss the corporate formation costs in Greece? In the past, this has it prohibited innovation. She says, I see the costs have come down. Are there any incentives for creating global companies? Uh, well, yes, company formation costs have come down. Um, we, for example, we uh, in our venture capital firm tell entrepreneurs it's cheaper to start your, your initial corporate scheme in Greece. And then when you grow, you can flip it to the US or to the UK or to Holland or uh, other places, but yes, uh, corporate formation is not an issue anymore. And uh, uh, the other strategy, many good technology startups have is what they call the dual geography. They have their corporate headquarters somewhere outside of Greece and they have a branch or a subsidiary in Greece and that works fine. So we don't have this issue anymore. Any final word, Manoli? Well, uh, final word is I'm actually more optimistic than what was when I started the position, I have to say. Right. I see a lot more potential. Um, 
it's certainly not easy. Um, but I think, uh, I think actually this COVID-19 uh, pandemic is, could actually change the ranking of priorities in, um, in, within, within Greece and internationally, of course. And that could be an opportunity that we could build upon. It's one of these crises that the recovery from it, even though it's not gonna be very long, I, I think, and I hope, uh, could actually uh, bring up several aspects of life that we have been ignoring. I think research has been clearly one of these areas that people have recognized as important, just even having the infrastructure. And I think that, and I'm hopeful that this government now seeing how important it was will probably change its priorities and, and probably seek more funding and more structure for Greek research. Okay, I think we'll stop here. Thank you everybody for watching this first webcast. Stay tuned for the next. We're going to have, I hope, four or five more in the next couple of months. Um, so we will leave you now. Bye bye. Bye, thank you. For anybody who's still on, you can see on your screen the next event, which is on Monday, the 18th May, and it's about COVID 19 antibody detection with Leonidas Alexopoulos, who is a founder of a startup and a professor at uh, Polytechnic in Greece. And uh, George Petrochilos is the moderator.